Sometimes I am asked why modern writers are needed if Dostoevsky was already there. <laughs> uh, in such cases, I answer that Dostoevsky could not have known everything that will happen in the 20th and uh, 21st centuries. He spoke of the struggle between good and evil, yes, but it was assumed that in his time it was clear what is good and what is evil. The peculiarity of our time is that it is no longer no longer very clear to many. Hello and welcome to Why Are We Talking About Rabbits? Yes, that's this podcast. Heavy things done lightly. We look at philosophy and theology, history, current events, and we do it through the lens of something we call the old world, new world divide today on this show. It's kind of cool. We have a Russian novelist, not only that, a Russian best-selling novelist. Eugene Vodolotskin is joining us right after I'm done with this. He talks about Loris, his best-selling book. He talks about the aviator. He talks about time. Is Russia West East? Or is it new? Or is it old? And then what is paradox? Lots of other things on today's episode. This is episode 41. This is Waktar bringing you Eugene Vodolaskin. So hi, everybody. You're back on Watar, And today we're blessed and I'm excited. And if you can hear my voice, I'm nervous because we're welcoming Eugene Vodolaskin, who is a Russian author and the author of Loris, a book that we have everyone in our on our First Things team read. Uh, he's also the author of other books, which we'll get into. Uh, but he's joining us from Russia today, uh, St. Petersburg. Eugene, hello. How are you? Hello, John. Nice. How are you? <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm excited and a little nervous and very excited to uh, have really, I think, one of the great authors um, really, really living on earth right now, writing about topics that are super important for the soul of, of, of men and women. And for a conversation you have in your book for regularly is about what is reality and how does it work? And today that fits nicely into what we're doing on our podcast. So let me start by introducing you to folks who listen to our uh, podcast here in America. This is uh, Mr. Vodolatskin. You were born in 1964. Uh, you're a Russian scholar, but also uh, a novelist. You graduated from the philological department in Kiev, Kiev University, and uh, eventually did postgraduate courses at, at the Pushkin House. And you've been awarded uh, various fellowships, I think, at home and abroad, and have written a marvelous article. This is where I, I really decided I wanted to try to get you on our show. You wrote a, a marvelous article in the magazine First Things. Um, you've won the Alexander Solzhenitsyn Literature Prize in 2019 and considered one of the most contemporary, important contemporary Russian writers going today. So some of the books that you've written, we won't name them all, are Soloviev and Larionov, Larionov, forgive me, um, Loris, uh, The Aviator, House in the Island. And a, no, a number of other books. And as I mentioned earlier, Loris became a family favorite. And when I left my job to run First Things, which is our nonprofit, Eugene, uh, Loris became one of the books on our reading list for the men and women who go into the field and spend two years working in uh, unique neighborhoods, impoverished neighborhoods, helping local people. And the reason for that is Loris takes you on a journey into the soul. And so that's you. I hope I didn't leave anything out. Thank you for your introduction. Uh, uh, so I have nothing to add. Okay, super. Mm -hmm. Let's start with a question um, about time. So it seems like in your books, 
this is for sure in Loris and the aviator, but I think in most of your writing, time seems essential on some level. And what is interesting about time and movement through time uh, is that there's something about change that when you get into it in your books, it's intriguing. So I wonder what is time to you? What is going on with the notion of time in your books, especially in Loris? Um, well, uh, the time, so the first uh, thing I have to do is to beg your pardon for my poor English. Uh, um, I don't believe in my English. Uh, um, that is why I try to, to write down a few lines uh, and uh, so if you are not against, I will uh, look a little bit uh, with my left eye to uh, my uh, text. By the way, uh, maybe it is typical for Russian writers because Nabokov, uh, as he spoke uh, on TV, uh, one can see uh, a paper on his table uh, maybe it is a little bit more than a help um, in uh, during the um, uh, speaking, but uh, it is uh, so. Maybe Russian writers more believe in a written words than in oral one. I see. Uh, let us uh, so after this uh, um, obligatory words. Um, I would uh, try to answer your question. Super. So about the time. So I will try to, uh, to begin from the very beginning. Uh, time uh, in the ancient history uh, had no beginning or end. I mean, uh, so-called pagan history uh, or the history before uh, Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a circle. The circle was a symbol of the uh, ancient time. By the way, uh, it is, uh, I have read a very interesting book of American professor William Adler, Time Immemorial. Mm -hmm. uh, he, there he writes uh, very interesting about the time uh, in history and uh, uh, the most ancient history. Uh, in Judeo-Christian history, time has a beginning, the creation of the world, and has uh, its uh, final point that is uh, uh, that sometimes is called um, uh, the end of the world. Uh, so, uh, Christian history is not only a horizontal movement. On this scale, we see vertical lines uh, uh, everywhere. Mm, this uh, is an exit into eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, time is open for a Christian. History is a person's movement from eternity before his time, his historical time, and uh, to eternity after this time. So uh, it is a um, famous expression, uh, history is a way from eternity to eternity. Wow. And um, hist history is a person's, uh, so when a man was created, there was no time. Uh, it appeared after the fall. God uh, gave man time. Time is finiteness. Uh, I try to sp to uh, speak this word uh, finiteness. Finite. Yeah, finite, finite, finite. Mm -hmm. finiteness, uh, and the finiteness is death. Uh, so, therefore, speaking um, about the meaning of life, we cannot do without the meaning of death, mm. and hence without time. Uh, so the gift to mankind uh, was 
time and death you know, after the fall. Despite the fact that I talk a lot about eternity, the meaning of time is extremely important for me. First of all, without the idea of time, we could not speak with you to today. Mm. Uh, so we tried to find out uh, my time. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, Russia has, as far as I remember, uh, eight or nine uh, time, time zones. Mm -hmm. time zones. Mm -hmm. And I live in St. Petersburg and belong to Moscow uh, time zone. Um, but it is not the only point why the time is so important for me. I will try to explain my idea. Man was created as likeness of God. Mm. He, is a free, he has a free will in almost everything. He is not free only in one thing, the time of his arrival in the world. Here he does not choose. This just suggests that a special meaning is attached to the time of personal birth. Uh, okay. This is the field in which a person must work. The protagonist of the aviator, my novel aviator, loses the, his time and uh, is transferred to another time. At first, it seems to him okay that it is not so scary that people in his old time are replaced by other people in a new time. But this is not the case. The meaning of this experiment is that everyone around us is unique. Hmm. Uh, unique like time. And there is no substitute for anyone. No substitute. That is why all such things as traveling in time and uh, uh, the ideas of cryonics uh, and uh, from my point of view, suspicious things, uh, mm. because it is an attempt uh, to substitute one time with another. And the tragedy of my protagonist is that he lost uh, his time, but he found that he can receive the new time. He can't live uh, in this time uh, because time it is the area of God I see. Uh, to make some uh, experiments in this field is rather dangerous I would say more the time in ancient times had a special meaning for example if we will read uh, old Russian letopis or annals, uh, we will see that each year uh, has a, descript a description of events that took place mm -hmm. this year. Uh, year, um, for example, 1037, uh, the, uh, the Cathedral of St. Sophia was built in Kiev, and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, suddenly we can see in year number uh, uh, 2052 was nothing. Why it is so? We called uh, this thing the empty years of Russian annals. By the way, we Russians have here um, uh, good uh, brothers in arms, uh, annals from Ireland, uh, okay. they are also the, they the, also have empty years. It was very important that uh, no one year will be missed, that the time will preserve, the continuity of the, of time will will be preserved, and it is very interesting that. Mm, uh, as Peter the First make a reform of. Uh, the calendar and of the style. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, he substituted um, uh, the style um, uh, 
reckoning, years reckoning from beginning of the world. Uh, instead of this, he put Anno Domini uh, style. I see. But he used the era, uh, so-called Byzantine era. Uh, the difference between Byzantine era and African era was eight years. And okay. old believers, it is, it was a part of Orthodox community in Russia. It is, it was a great tragedy, this division. They used so-called African year, uh, year. And this eight years, they didn't know where they are. And they were, so they made a sort of revolution uh, because they said, Peter, is the Antichrist uh, because he makes manipulations with time. The old believers said that the about old Peter. Believers, yes, mm, and uh, he said that he added eight years that no one lived. <laughs> uh, it was a very bad thing to do tricks with the time. So, th when the annals, the Russian annals, when when the Russian historians, the medieval historians, say there was a year when there were no, there were no historical, you called them empty years. What's the significance of those empty years? The goal of these empty years is to produce the uh, line without interruptions. Oh. Um, uh, that, by the way, the years were used mostly in Russia. In uh, Byzantine uh, uh, tradition, uh, there were emperors. Uh, each, uh, if, for example, a chapter in Russian annals is a year, so Byzantine chapter is uh, an emperor. And, um, oh, okay. um, uh, for example, and there you will find all the emperors, uh, even those that um, ruled only one day or two days. Historically, they uh, played no role, but uh, mystically, it was very, uh, very important that the role of the mm -hmm. emperors will be without any missing uh, will stay without any corruptions. Uh, mm. Each name, it is not just a name, not just a person. Uh, it is a mark for the time. Right. It's, it's, it's how we know we're in reality, or, or, or it's how we mark that we're, we're here. It, Right, as opposed to the eternal clock, which, which we're not, how should we say, we're destined for eternity, but when we keep time, we're reminded of our mortality. Am I saying that right? Uh, yes, uh, in Orthodox uh, tradition, we know such a, an expression: the death is the birth for eternity. I think that's, yeah. I, but Eugene, this is very foreign to a certain type of thinking. So that leads me to a, a, a second question. In, on this show, on this podcast, uh, we talk about the old world and the new world. Uh, and for us Americans, most of us who go and work overseas, we see there's some sort of culture that we call old world. And what we find is it's, it's a, it's, it's a culture, it's a group of cultures in Africa, for example, or in Southeast Asia or in Central America, we see that cultures tend to know themselves as old because they're not imbued with enlightenment values. And so we've come to understand on this podcast that there's such a thing as new world thinking and old world thinking. I wonder, and new world here being 
post-enlightenment, mathematical, scientific, rational. Do you think this is a, is this real? Am, am, I, am I describing something that seems real to you? Is there such a type of division in the way people think around the world? Or is this just odd? Uh, well, uh, the expressions old world and new world uh, in Russian history um, were used mainly in the context of the 1917 revolution. Ah, okay. In particular, one song of that time sung to the music of the Marseillaise began with the words, let us renounce the old world. Wow. One of the slogans of the revolution was the opposition of the new world to the old. Uh, this moment is played out in my novel, Justifying the Island. It is my last novel. Uh, which has been published uh, recently. The new was automatically declared good and the old bad. The futurism uh, was the heart of the communist utopia, uh, which created the cult of the future. At the same time, if we take our common civilization, I mean common East and West, East and West European civilization, the futurism was not always the mainstream. The civilization of the Middle Ages was built in exactly the opposite way. Uh, there, the center of history lay in the past, not in future, as it is, as it was, for example, in communist utopia. utopia. Mm. Uh, this center was the best, the birth of Christ, and the course of history was seen as a gradual distancing from Christ and a deterioration. It is my deep con uh, conviction that the era that we uh, conventionally call the modernity, by the way, in Russian, literally, it is called the new time. Okay. Is coming to an end. Uh, it doesn't mean that a new Middle Ages is coming to the world. We are talking about the return of some medieval forms, uh, which I wrote about in the magazine Fresh Things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, most likely, there will be renewed attention to, to traditional values. This process will, be, will not be the same throughout the world. Due to the peculiarities of its development, emphasized futurism in the communist period, Russia's turn to traditional discourse now looks more intense than we see in the West. However, the West is not uh, homogeneous here. Uh, either uh, Italy and Poland, for example, are very traditional countries. In these circumstances, the terminology new world and old world loses its definitive, uh, definiteness hmm. because in the era of historical changes, the terms begin to be assessed ambiguously. 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 Uh, the concepts of old and new should be separated from the division west east. It is something another. Mm. This division exists within the boundaries of European civilization, to which not only Western Europe belongs, but also Russia and the United States. Now a dramatic moment has come in relations between the West and the East. Uh, I try to be objective in my judgments, but in my opinion, Russia was not the initiator of current cooling. Uh, after the fall uh, of the USSR under uh, Gorbachev, Yeltsin and Putin, Russia consistently tried to unite with the West. I would say that uh, uh, Russia, once I used such a, an expression that Russia was like a woman that wanted to be married very much, but uh, <laughs> her wish uh, she was scorned we, uh, yes, we turned her uh, away nobody uh, nobody married her <laughs> uh, 
And uh, the desire was clearly expressed both in the level of people. People were very Protestant in Russia in the 90s. And uh, even uh, governments, uh, uh, di different governments, governments was, that we had, uh, they were also pro-Western, mm, uh, but it wasn't supported. And on the contrary, new borders began to be created intensively. This is not the place to find out why this happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but I say this with sadness as a pro-European and pro-Western person. Seeing this attitude, Russia abruptly changed its line. It may very well be that the point of no return has already been passed. And yet, contrary to the obvious, I do not lose hope that we will reunite it with the West. Mm. Uh, first, historically and culturally, we are close relatives. Secondly, we need each other. Uh, at a time when European civilization is losing its significance, we should be together. Mm, and uh, I am a historian. Uh, I'm very far from politics. Uh, I avoid uh, to uh, enter this area. If I speak about politics, I speak uh, about it just uh, is about a part of history. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a modern, it is a, I would say, present continuous of history. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I see that uh, uh, even in the Middle Ages, we were much more close to each other than now. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we must remember that uh, we are Christians. And uh, Christianity, it is one of the, of the most important features of European culture. I uh, say again that uh, America and Russia, they belong also to European uh, culture. They are part of this culture. Right. Uh, not even belong, they, they are part. Uh, and mm -hmm. How do you see... Orthodox Christianity in that most expansive story you just told, is it old or does it bridge the two worlds? Can it, can it, can it survive in what you're calling modernity or the new world? What, what is your Russian Orthodox Christianity in that sense? I would say that uh, I avoid uh, an expression Russian uh, orthodoxy um, because, well, orthodoxy, it is a, a part of uh, Christianity. Mm -hmm. Orthodoxy is Christianity. Orthodoxy is not a, an ethnographical museum. Mm -hmm. And I know that some Russians, they think of orthodoxy as a Russian faith. Uh, Russian Christianity, but it seems to me it is not uh, a, cor a correct position. Mm -hmm. If, for example, I have to do with non-Russian uh, Christians, with non-Russian uh, Orthodox, um, I'm, I feel myself very good. Uh, I, see. I, I like them because the people that initially didn't exist in this area. They see much more than those who uh, were born uh, in this tradition. Mm -hmm. And that is why I think that we have um, the idea of Christianity uh, or Orthodox Christianity, uh, but uh, I would say that uh, to speak of uh, Russian Christianity, uh, it is something like uh, to speak about uh, Russian mathematics, uh, okay. uh, yeah. Russian physics, uh, and so on. I see. Interesting. 
let's move to another question about um, remembering or memory. Uh, one of my favorite notions from the ancient Orthodox East, and it's something you you play around in in Loris and a lot of your writings, uh, is that remembering from the Greek is to remember, to put things back together, sort of in reality. And, you know, in, in that way, it's the idea of the incarnation is God is being remembered in the communion. And in the New Testament, you see, two types of remembering and only one type is about thinking back or reflecting. And I think you play around with this idea in Loris and an aviator, and it's a joy. And I think for many in the West, it's an odd understanding. So what, what is to remember for you? What, what is memory? How would you describe that? In essence, a person has, has nothing but a history a general history and a personal history, and history is memory. Hmm. When a person loses memory, he loses experience, and with experience, he loses his personality. Uh, the same is happening with the people, and the consequences are catastrophic. As you know, as I already said, that uh, the circle was a model of ancient history. Mm -hmm. uh, I already mentioned uh, history had no beginning and no end. From this point of view, the same reasons lead uh, to the same consequences. But the model of Christian history is a spiral. Uh, and uh, Events repeat themselves, yes, but on, on, on a new level. Mm -hmm. This is the basis of the so-called typolo typological exegesis. Christ appears uh, as the new Adam, uh, and the Virgin Mary as a new Eve. Mm. Christian exegesis... exegesis uh, yeah. Exegesis. Mm -hmm. Exegesis produces hundreds of such pairs. I see. This is what I'm talking about in Loros. I developed the well-known idea that the Orthodox Divine Service does not simply remember the events of the sacral history. It lives them again. Mm. It lives them with a memory about the previous uh, previous. Mm. Uh, or the first time of this event. All things made new. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, and in a new situation. Uh, so he lives these events in a new situation, mm -hmm. if you want, if you like. And here is uh, here it is important to understand uh, to what extent we are able to be Christians in our modern life. It seems to a very small extent. Right. Uh, but there is another type of memory that I write about in the novel, The Aviator. It is admiration of God's world, hmm. which is perfection, and every detail is of great value. My protagonist, Inokenti Platonov, is trying to resurrect all the details of the pre-revolutionary world in Russia, hmm. uh, which no longer exists. He keeps a diary in which he says very little about the big history. His memories are dedicated to various little things, smells, colors, sounds. Uh, this is also history uh, in its own way it is no less important than a big history. That's right. But it is not included in any handbook of history. Mm -hmm. It hurts Platonov that this very important part of the world disappears without uh, a trace. Finally, there is what is conventionally called history lessons. In my books, uh, I try to show that the lessons of history cannot be political. 
because political circumstances never repeat themselves mm. in full, uh, which means that they will not will never lead to the same consequences. Does this mean that uh, history has no lessons? No, it doesn't. Uh, these are simply lessons of a moral nature. Right. Uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, this is exactly how the pedagogical role of history was understood. They justly realized that the history of mankind as such has no purpose. Uh, it consists of millions of wills. Only man has a goal. Only a person has a goal. Mm -hmm. The subject of morality can only be a person. Uh, a person and not a state, people or humanity. Therefore, the moral view of history is based on a personalistic view. History was seen in the Middle Ages as a set of examples. Str uh, struggle between good and evil. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so I, so I, I kept thinking of the word icon toward the end there. It's a series. Morality becomes a conversation about people and about, in, and that is that why the Orthodox East is always looking at, at saints and hagiography to explain history is is that why that's an essential part of the eastern christianity yes history is a very essential part uh, of uh, christianity as such i would say but why it is so the actually the bible is a historical writing that's right in a certain yeah. sense that's right it is a history of people and each uh, medieval Mm, historical writing is a little Bible. It is the diary of a folk. And uh, you know that manuscripts, uh, there were not, not uh, so there were a few manuscripts of uh, annals. Uh, it was not uh, an evening uh, newspaper that everybody mm -hmm. read. Mm -hmm. Nobody read them. They were preserved uh, in uh, the in monasteries mm -hmm. to whom spoke the analysts to God uh, not to people of course uh, so um, it was possible to read it uh, and somebody read the annals but it was a conversation mostly with the God right with God right and uh, what is uh, very important here the important uh, difference between modern history and the history of the middle ages you know modern history it is a horizontal view that's right because uh, and it is always biased it is always a, a point of view of some party some nation uh, some class uh, mm -hmm. or social group. In uh, if we'll uh, speak about the um, history in the Middle Ages, it was uh, a view from heaven. Yes. Little example. Byzantine Hamertolos Chronicle uh, describes as Russians they were. Uh, at those time, uh, pagans, uh, mm -hmm. 19th, 9th century, they came to Constantinople and killed many people. They were very brutal. Mm, and uh, this place was borrowed from Byzantine Chronicle to Russian Enel, Nestor Chronicle. Mm -hmm. It was a good occasion to uh, to change, sorry, something in this text, a uh, little bit to put it under the censorship. I but see. Uh, Russian analysts, uh, they didn't touch this text. He uh, was a Christian, 
and uh, he understood from this point of view that uh, Russians were very bad in this situation and he has no one word uh, to support them you know, or to uh, somehow to um, uh, propagandize to, yeah and change yes. the words uh, yeah he had only one dimension good and evil mm. uh, and uh, uh, it is a good example that medieval point of view was universal uh, universal I mean uh, in area of Christian uh, civilization mm -hmm. it was universal and modern uh, historical point of view is local uh, and uh, can't be another and political and political political means local right 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 and having to do with temporal power or the here and now yes yeah super i think of this and this is kind of leads me to another question i th i think of there's a dichotomy between sort of at least in america the spiritual world and the world I live in, you know, the world that God is, I'm going to and the world that I'm in, there's this dichotomy, which sometimes seems false to me. And in, in your writing, especially in Loris, there's something about Loris that's disorienting. There's something about his existence that's paradoxical. Like, it's, it's, it's always both and at the same time. It's not one or the other. He's both a sinner and also a holy fool. It's just, it's disorienting, I think, for a lot of people. But I think, this is my question, mm -hmm. is the spiritual life disorienting or is it reorienting maybe? Is it meant, if we're on a spiritual path, is it meant to be disorienting? Like, whoa, what happened to me? Is that something like that happening? I would say that all the truths are, uh, they have many levels. And uh, the most uh, difficult of them, uh, the truth uh, not, uh, must not be obligatory, simple. Hmm. Uh, some things are very difficult. And difficult things things could be expressed expressed only through paradox truth is is multi-dimensional for example i say i like my people best of all uh, it is my uh, my greatest love my mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. but at the same time i say it doesn't mean that I like other nations less than mine. Right. It is a difficult, complicated feeling, but we must not try to simply fixate uh, the things, the difficult things. Uh, and as to your question, of course, this way, the way uh, of uh, the way to God uh, has uh, many uh, has many difficult places. Mm -hmm. uh, and as to saints, uh, we must uh, remember that a saint is not a person who has no sense. It is a person that can work with his sins. And uh, to a person who can, uh, whose metanoia uh, yeah. enough strong to to destroy a sin. Metanoia being the power of transformation or change. Is that right? Yes, it is as a change uh, of. Uh, 
in German Hirn. Uh, uh-huh. So uh, the mind uh, to change the mind. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Could, could... It is uh, a, a literal translation of this Greek word, changing a mind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, those who change their mind, they uh, change their behavior. Yes. Could we jump down a little and talk about um, writing in Dostoevsky? Yes, of course. Because... You know, I'm not alone. Um, many people in the in the West who are seeing their sort of Protestant world come out from under them, or in other words, there's a change in the way that Christianity is being understood in America now. When that happens, people begin to reassess their Christianity. And I know many people who start to read classics or they're they're interested in artistry and they stumble on Dostoevsky and there's something about Dostoevsky that is appealing to many sort of converts to orthodoxy and really just people right now there's something harsh about him that's appealing something rough but you know Dostoevsky's books as you know they they tend to emphasize the dirty in order to explain what's clean something like that so who is Dostoevsky to you? Because I know a lot of people that love your books that say, oh my gosh, he's doing something that Dostoevsky was doing. That's a lot of praise for you, but who, who is Dostoevsky to you? So I will start uh, with the author's goal. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that an author, that an author should have a goal well-defined purpose. They also must have a direction. Yeah. If uh, So a well-defined uh, purpose moves the text from the field of literature to the field of preaching. Preaching is an important genre. Uh, but if uh, we are talking about literature, we need to use its tools. Mm-hmm. If literature calls somewhere, uh, it uh, does so not by means of an imperative, but by describing reality. That is what you spoke about in Dostoevsky's case. And it is better if reader draws if reader, actually reader, not writer, draws his conclusions. Right. Uh, it is the contrast uh, to preaching. Actually, this is what happens in good literature. I love Dostoevsky very much. He foresaw many of the misfortunes of the 20th century. For example, the novel Demons is about this. But it goes much deeper than the social dimension. Uh, It is about the struggle between God and devil. Mm. And as you remember, according to Dostoevsky, the field of the struggle is the human soul. Sometimes I'm asked why modern writers are needed if Dostoevsky was already there. (laughs) Uh, In such cases, I answer that Dostoevsky could not have known everything that will happen in the 20th and uh, 21st centuries. He spoke of the struggle between good and evil, yes but it was assumed that in his time, it was clear what is good and what is evil. The peculiarity of our time is that it is no longer no longer very clear to many mm-hmm. what is good and what is bad. And in this situation, it is a great challenge for every Christian. Yeah, he, the context, 
same conversation, good and evil, but the context, you're right, is fundamentally different. Uh, yes, and uh, actually Dostoevsky, yes, somebody can say that uh, uh, you're right, that he uh, reflected dirty side of the life and it's uh, better sides. Mm -hmm. And some sometimes uh, his dirty sides are too dirty. <laughs> uh, yes, but still he understood the difference yeah. between these two areas. And now it is actually terrible that uh, some that comes new ethic and uh, says, friends, it is not bad, it is good. Right, right. From now on, it is good. Some believe that it is good, some that uh, it is bad, and this relativeness is very dangerous. Yeah. In some ways, dangerous. it's we're living in the chapter after Dostoevsky's finished The Demons. It's the next chapter where the deep relativism is now our context. And as a teacher, Eugene, I saw as I got, as I taught into 2010, 11, 12, you know, up until right just a couple of years ago, as a teacher, I saw the conversation much harder to start the conversation about good and evil. It wasn't that you couldn't have it. You know, I taught 18 year olds. I could have a conversation about good and evil, but it was a much harder conversation to begin because there were so many different relative contexts. Each person felt that they had to define for themselves what good and evil was, as if each of us had a different good and evil. And so before you can even talk about good and evil, you had to have everyone weigh in on what their good and evil is. And there was almost no common vocabulary for what it was. That's, that's how my classroom looked. That's how the kids spoke. And so by the time you got into the depth of the conversation, and by the time you got into, you know, the deep philosophy or theology, everyone was already tired. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I would say that what is uh, really dangerous, uh, that, uh, the, so if we'll speak uh, about moral ethics, uh, in the time of Middle Ages, the ethics, uh, so moral was based uh, on, not only based, moral was uh, Christianity. Yeah, right, right. Uh, later, moral was also, uh, so people uh, that didn't that didn't believe in God, uh, they uh, still they had the same moral with those who believed because the influence of um, religious ethics was very strong. Yeah. Uh, but now we see the birth of new ethics that has nothing to do with religious uh, ethics. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it is something new. And if you say to somebody, uh, it is, so don't do it, the question why? Because it is okay. bad. Who told you that it is bad? This is it. This is it. Mm -hmm. And it, one of the things we talk about is when that happens, it's okay, but culture becomes difficult. It becomes difficult to create culture in such an environment. There can be no unifying moral code. And I wonder how that ends. Who knows? It doesn't have to... Are you hopeful? Are you hopeful for this postmodern age? Does Is there hope in you? Like what? what inside of you gives you hope these days? as a Russian in St. Petersburg. 
you know, <laughs> there are different types of hope. Right. Uh, so we have a joke that such a question was put to optimist and to pessimist. And uh, optimist, uh, pessimist, the pessimist says it, would, it will be uh, much more worse. Mm -hmm. It would be worse. And optimist says it couldn't be worse. <laughs> and so it couldn't be worse, right? Yes. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That's what I, I think I'm that person. I, I think I think negatively, but hope for beauty each day. I hope something like that. Yes, so, uh, but it was a joke. It is, it is not. Sure. I am. Uh, I believe that uh, um, you know history is a pendulum. Uh, it is a main uh, principle for history. Mm. Uh, now it is not the best position of uh, this pendulum, but history has its rhythmus. Uh, and hmm. many things, uh, good things that we lost will come back. Yeah. Amen. I think you're right. So can I, can I end up by doing, can I invite you? So we'll throw a party for you and then we'll introduce you to some people here in America. Uh, so once we were already in America and fell in love with your country. As Americans are a very benevolent people, I would mm. say, uh, while the Americans, it seems to me, are persistent in their search for God. Uh, they are not indifferent. It is very important. Uh, as for Georgia, this culture is very close to Russians, yeah. both in a deep sense and in the sense of everyday life. Uh, Russians appreciate the Georgian style of life. For example, a toastmaster is called in Russia Tamada. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, for myself, I can say that when I have a choice between several restaurants, I always prefer Georgia. Oh, you do? That's fantastic. Yes. So if we will have a um, Georgian party, our common Georgian party, it will be, I will be happy. This is great because as a part of our work, uh, we don't have offices, but we've, we've been given a nice donation to start a, a little meeting place, a restaurant where our theme will be the Supra and Kinkali and Hajapuri and, and Swadi and all that. And we're going to open it this summer. And so, Really, we'd love you to come, and we'll 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 do American things around a Georgian table in America. I think it would be quite fun. So I hope you we'll talk. Okay, about that. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I just want to thank you again. You you were brilliant and wonderful with your English. I know you were worried about that. I think it will be fantastic. People will really like what you had to say and you said it really really beautifully so thank you for uh coming on and speaking and doing the in the interview in english eugene i appreciate that thank you thank you very much for me it was uh, a great pleasure uh because people that are so far from each other uh, can uh, feel love to each other that's right uh and uh, can speak as Dost, uh, do you remember Dostoevsky wrote, what uh, are Russian boys speaking about if they gather about God? So we are like two Russian boys spoke about <laughs> God. <laughs> you know what? Deep down, I think that is the joy that's just bubbling up now in America. Because people are feeling things fade away, I think many of us want to be like those boys that Dostoevsky writes about. And if it's not always God that we talk about, it's the things of God. And I think it's happening. And so I hope this conversation's part of it. 
Thank I, you. I hope I wasn't too, I felt very nervous. <laughs> Thank you for your patience with me. You're, Thank you for your patience. Yeah, it was wonderful. So, okay, guys, that's Eugene Vodolaskin, the author of Loris and Aviator. And I wish I had said Soliviev and Larionov. I can't say it still, forgive me. Uh, and other books, and uh, he was on Wattar today. Thank you, Eugene. And um, thank you, John. Let's keep talking. Wow, Shetty's Gagi Marjos. That's Georgian for to you the victory, and that's what we're going to be saying around a table. Let's figure out how to get Mr. Vodolatskin over here. Let's get him on a tour. Let's talk to folks about his profoundly interesting and really. Uh, groundbreaking stuff his work his writing very happy to have him today eugene thank you thank you to all of you for tuning in this is watar why are we talking about rabbits this is brought to you by the creators of first things foundation we're a nonprofit. we send people into some of the world's most interesting and forgotten and impoverished places where we live for two years at a time peace corps style but we do projects a lot differently come join us we're looking for someone right now to head to West Africa and join us if you'd like to be a part of First Things through support or perhaps you're good at something like being a lawyer who wants to give us legal aid. We always need that in our wild world. There's a lot of ways to help. Tune in. Check us out at first-things.org and most of all, keep listening. Nakvamdist. Hasta luego. Kambufo. Peace out. Dos vidanya.